Job chapter 29 and verse 10. I have never preached this message before. It's new to me. And so bear with me because there's several different rabbit trails I could take. And I want to focus on the thought at hand. And I'm going to ask you a question. Have you had a restlessness that has come into your spirit that at times you cannot get over for weeks or months and you can't explain it and you can't pray it away and you can't go to your brothers and sisters and intercede and it break. Has anybody been there? Raise your hands right now and wave it this way, Brother Stone. A restlessness, a very strange restlessness. Well, I'm going to tell you what's happening. Are you ready for this? I'm going to read the text, but I'm going to tell you what is happening. Job 29 and 10. Job said, Then I said, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as sand. For the next few moments... I'm going to tell you what your situation is. God is stirring up your nest. And you can't figure out why God is stirring up your nest. Now we must look at the verse to understand why Job, who is in a precarious, terrible, horrible position, writes the word that he writes and says the phrase that he says. According to Job chapter 1, we do not know where Job actually lives. Some suggest the area of Saudi Arabia. Some suggest the area of the Negev Desert, uh, that region. But we do know there had to be plenty of water and plenty of grass because of the number of animals that he had. It wasn't just a dry desert region. Because the Bible tells us in the beginning of the book of Job that he had 3,000 camels, 7,000 sheep. He had 1,000 yoke of oxen and houses and 10 children that were older and each had a home of their own. And the Bible calls him the greatest man in the East. Lightning fell and killed the sheep. A group of nomads invaded on horses and rode off pushing the animals with them and capturing his animals. We know that a whirlwind, a tornado or a hurricane of some kind, fell on the homes and killed 10 children who were feasting in the home. This man lost everything he owned with the exception of three servants that survived and his wife who was critical of him. Obviously, she married him for the money. You, can I go there? Because when he lost everything he had, she told him to curse God and just die. Why do you want your husband to die? Because he's lost all the money. You're not going to get to go shopping at Macy's like you did. Come on now. Come on, girls, help me out. And so she figured if he'll die, she can go marry another one somewhere. So you got to get rid of him first. And he told her, you speak like a foolish woman. Now, here's what happens. The second attack comes to him, takes his health out, boils break out on his body to the point that his friends say in Job 2 that when they saw him coming, they did not know who he was. And for seven days, he sat in dust and just scratched the boils but would say nothing. And then as you progress from Job Job chapter 3 into Job here 29, you will hear Job reminiscing about what used to be. Now stay with me because this is, this is the nest we're talking about. Job begins to say in the book of Job, in months past, when I walked in the darkness, the light of God shined upon me and my children. He then says later in the book of Job, when I washed my steps with uh, with oil, the, um, when, I, when, I, when I washed my steps in, in, in butter, the rock poured me out rivers of oil. A metaphor for the favor and anointing of God that was on his life in days gone by. He also says that when I was in my former days of prosperity, when I would sit at the gate, the princes of the nations would come and listen to me speak with my wisdom, and the young men would sit silent while I would talk to them about wisdom and direction, and I, we would say at this day, the business principles of how I have made it through faith in God. And then Job continues to talk about, when I spoke, the people blessed me. I helped the poor. I helped the widow. 
widow. I helped the fatherless. Those that were ready to die, I stood there with them to be a part of them in their departure. I was, this is Job talking. I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. To those who had nothing, I was for them. And those who tried to, to disrupt the poor and abuse them, I would reach in and break the jaws of the wicked. Now here's a man that would have been a fine friend to have. Here is someone that he, had he been a part of your life, that if you had a financial need, he would have helped you out. That if you had a family problem, he'd have sat down and counseled you. And here is a man now after talking about, don't miss it, after talking about all the blessings that he had, he makes this statement. And I was ready to die in my nest. I was ready. I was so content and I was, I'm going somewhere whether you, uh, I'm setting you up. Uh, I was so happy and I was so rested and I was so blessed with prosperity that I said to myself, I'll stay in my comfort zone. I will just stay in my nest and I'll just have a happy old life and raise my kids and grandkids, leave them an inheritance when I'm gone, but I'm going to stay in my nest the rest of my life. Now he does not stay in his nest, but his nest is shaken up. He is cast out of the nest. Touch your neighbor and say this, neighbor, oh, you didn't hear me now. I jumped on you too fast. Say this, neighbor, God is going to stir up your nest. Ah. Oh my, would you look at somebody else and say, 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 say this. I don't think you heard me, neighbor. Say it. I don't think you heard me, neighbor. But God is about to stir up your nest. When we, in the, when the, in, in the economic world and banking world, they talk about the egg the egg's nest. And, and what that means is that you are going to retire and you can sit comfortably in your nest and have the finances you need to carry on the rest of your life. And then my wife and I are about to go through something called the empty nest. And oh, thank God for a grandbaby that's four months old because my wife would lose her mind. Come on, help me ladies. Uh, because Jonathan is out of the house now with Katie and Amanda's getting ready to go to school and she's homeschooled those kids every day of their life practically and she's about to change her routine after 20 some years and she does not know what to do with herself. So we're going to go through something that they call the empty nest syndrome. How many of you have been through it? Raise your hands. Oh my, I'm talking to some nesters in this house right now. And then there is what we call the nest of security. The security of your home or the security of the economic situation that you were in. And you were born, believe this or not, everybody here was born in a nest. They were born in a family. Hopefully you had a strong family. Hopefully you had a Christian family. But it seems odd to me. I have never understood this. I promise you, Robbie James has talked, I've talked to Robbie about this for years. Why is it with me? Why is it with me that I get one building done and I have to build another one? No, 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 I'm not kidding you. I finished an $18 million building and thought, praise God, it's done. Then we ran out of space and had to build a three-story lodge for small groups because we had no room in for youth. At $3 million at that, finally got it dedicated, and the fire marshal comes by and says, your warehouse is too small, your boxes are stacked too high, and I have just had to complete a $1 million warehouse, 20,000 square feet directly behind me and now my wife comes along while I'm trying to get back in my nest. Talk to me somebody. I'm trying to get back in my nest and in those feathers and get comfortable and she says now you got to know you're going on 60 years of age and you've been telling everybody for 15 years that you're going to build a youth camp so when you're going to build that youth camp it's like woman I'm going to pull a job on you shut up. 
God going to have to build. No, God ain't going to build that thing. You got to build that thing because God told you to build that thing. And here I am. Has anybody ever been there right, right when you're comfortable, right when, when the prayer was answered and right when you got the new house? And yeah, you know, it's Murphy's Law. Praise God, I got four new tires and you find out they're all recap tires. Uh, Murphy's Law. Yes, the Maytag repairman comes to your house and says, it's funny, but I've never seen one this bad in my entire life. Uh, and then uh, Murphy's Law says that the line you get in that's the shortest line is the one where the two people in front of you lost their money and forgot their credit card. How many know what I'm saying? And 25 people have already gone by while you're still standing in that line. Murphy's Law, I, I tell you, I used to know about 20 things with Murphy's Law, but Murphy's Law doesn't work in this instance, but I want to tell you something that God, the reason I feel the anointing, you better get ready because I'm about to get stirred up in this place. The reason, many times, Times that God allows our nest to be rustled is because, are you ready for this? God doesn't want you settling. God doesn't want you getting content. And the Bible said that the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. And God knows that there's three kinds of people. Let me just preach this to you right here and tell you that there's three kinds of people. You have in the ministry of Jesus a family that was Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And you know the story, what they all three did. The Bible tells you that, that, uh, that, that uh, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and learned the word and worshiped. Now, over in the kitchen was Martha. Martha was cooking the dinner that everybody was going to eat after the preaching service. Uh, come on, how many know you got to have some Marthas? You can't have everybody worshiping because somebody's got to be back cooking the food because if they don't cook the food, we're going to get out of here at 5 o'clock instead of get out of here at 2. I'm preaching now. So somebody's got to be a Martha. Don't fuss at Martha all the time because everybody got to eat a hot meal because Martha decided to do her ministry. When my wife used to cook for people, used to get a suite in a hotel when we'd have a big conference and she'd cook for everybody because she says, baby, it's too late for the people to go out. They're getting out at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. The restaurant's going to be packed and our team needs to eat. And she'd stay in there and cook. And one time I jumped all over her. I said, well, what are you doing? I said, you can't enjoy the service because you got to get up and leave and count the offer. And then you count the offer, you go back to the hotel and you're fixing your food and she began to cry and I felt miserable. Oh, you women know how to manipulate with that. You know you know how. To. Just, just put you some fake water on there. Ooh, yeah, You got their attention immediately. And, and then I thought to myself, well, don't cry about it. I'm trying to help you. I'm not rebuking you. I'm just saying I'd rather have you in service. And God stopped me and said, son, you better shut up because she's doing her ministry. Oh, God. But I said, yes, Lord, but Martha, you rebuked Martha. He said, no, Martha got too cumbered down with it. Son, Somebody had to do the cooking. Somebody had to prepare the meal. I go ahead and preach. I'm going to. So you had Mary who's worshiping and you have Martha who is a worker. But guess what Lazarus is doing? Lazarus ain't even in the story. He's just sitting around. Lazarus just sitting around comfortable. Guess who died? Mary the worshiper didn't die. Martha the worker didn't die. But the guy that's just sitting around doing nothing, he's the guy that died. Sometimes God has got to stir your nest up because you're getting too content. And there's too many people that need the gospel. And there's too many people that are not being reached. And there's too many people not being witnessed to. So because God has a shortage of workers, every now and then God has got to stir up your nest. Let me give you three things about this real quick. See, number one is this. The church, by and large in America, is content with not being hungry spiritually. I'm going to prove it to you. When I grew up and the presence of God was near, you didn't try to get out by 12. The presence caused you to want to be in the presence deeper and more. So when you're in a rush to get out, what you're telling me is you have no hunger. I'll tell you what you have because a doctor explained this to me. You have an appetite and not a hunger. And what's the difference between, I asked Dr. Malili at Baton Rouge, what's the difference between appetite and hunger? He said, when you have an appetite, a cracker will satisfy. 
When you have an appetite, a bag of peanuts will satisfy. But he says it's a fact that when you are totally hungry, that you are not satisfied with cheese and crackers. You've got to have a full meal. You've got to have some meat in you. You've got to have some protein in you. And there is a difference in the body of Christ in America between a whole generation that has an appetite just to have a little sermon, a little preaching, and a little music. And people that say to themselves, there's got to be something something more than what I'm experiencing in God. And there are people who are hungry. And it did not say those that have an appetite shall be filled. It said they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. And the second thing I want to tell you is this. Too many people are satisfied with being satisfied. And when you get satisfied with being satisfied, you will get content and settled in your nest. And the thing about being settled that I'd like for you to understand is remember this, God never stays in one spot long. Even in the tabernacle, he said, pack it up and get it out. Pack it up and get it out. Pack it, take it across the Jordan River. Put it over here at Shiloh. No, take it from Shiloh and put it down here at Nob. God is always on the move. And the reason God mm, the the reason God is always on the moon, on the move, is because you have a tendency as a human being, and I have a tendency of liking our routine to the point that the routine becomes a rut. I'll prove it to you. You sit in the same seat every time you come to church. You want the same parking spot every time you come to church. You want to get to your spot at the restaurant at the same time. Don't get too early, but definitely don't get there too late because the Baptists will eat the restaurant out before you Pentecostals get there. Are you, tra- are you tracking with me? See, God is always on the move. And he knows that if you get content and you get settled, you're going to miss out on his movements. You're going to miss it. And the third thing I want to tell you is this. There are too many people that never take a risk. They just refuse. So I'd rather stay in my nest, nest and pastor you. God has stirred up your nest. You're doing what you're doing because God stirred up your nest. You could be very content just doing what you're doing. Pre- traveling across the country, preaching, praying with people, a, a, a Bible teaching, all the great things that you do. But God came and stirred up the man of God's nest. Why? Because when you get out of the nest, it proves that you're a risk taker. I'm willing to take the risk to do what I feel in my spirit the Lord would have me do because there is a purpose in why God has stirred up my... I hope I'm talking to somebody in this house. There's a reason God has made me restless. There's a reason God has stirred me up. Let me talk to you about a man who stepped out of a boat and give you a new twist on an old story. Jesus is walking on the water. In your Bible, it's at night... There has to be a full moon out because in Israel, in a full moon, you can see the reflection on Galilee. I've been there. So it has to be a full moon. And they see him walking on the water and they say, it is a ghost. Ghost is a King James word. They actually said, it is a spirit. Now, what did they mean by saying it is a spirit? Mendel Noon did research on the Sea of Galilee and wrote a book about it and said, in the time of Jesus... There were fishing boats that got caught in storms and the fishermen drowned and the boat is in the bottom of the lake. And what happened was that there was a belief that if you were fishing at night and all the fishermen fish at night, even to this day, because the fish surface from the deep water, they catch them in nets. But it was a belief in, in in the time of Jesus that if you saw a spirit apparition on the water, it meant a dead fisherman's spirit had come back to tell you your boat is next to sink. Now track with me because Peter's not as stupid as you think. There's 12 men in that boat. Jesus is on the water. And Peter makes this statement when they start screaming, it's a spirit, it's a spirit. Peter is a fisherman from the lake who knows the tradition that this boat is about to go down. There are no life vests. So Peter sees somebody out there who can walk on water. None of the 11 can do that in the boat. He realizes it is safer out there where that guy is than where he is at the present. He then says, and honestly, this is funny, Lord, if it's you, 
bid me come. Now, maybe you don't see the humor in that. But I'm saying to myself, Peter, what if it ain't him? I mean, have you thought about it, Peter? You didn't say, Lord, bid me come. You said, Lord, if, meaning that you didn't know if it was or was not. And so the voice just speaks back to him and said, come on, come, let's go. He steps out of the boat and begins to do something that no one had ever done outside of Jesus in history. He begins to physically walk toward the Lord in the middle of the night. Now watch. Peter's not stupid because it always puzzles me. What are you trying to do? Impress somebody? What are you trying to be Mr. Cool here? Yeah, I'm going to come walk out. Y'all watch me. Stand back. Elvis is in the house. Baby, I'm going to get my leg over to solve that boat. Baby, I'm going to shake that leg. Baby, you can watch me, baby. I'm going to walk on that water. No, you watch it, baby. I'm going to walk on baby, baby. I'm going to walk on water. You know, what's he trying to do? No, seriously. Is he trying to impress these 11 guys? Is he trying to have a story he can tell his family, you will not believe what I did? <laughs> Excuse me while I polish my nails. No. In reality, he thinks he's saving his life. Because if that's a spirit... And that spirit is warning them, that boat's going down. <clears throat> Hello. But he forgot something. And the 11 forgot something. Jesus had been telling them, every time they take a boat trip, let us go over to the other side. Us is plural. It means not just me, it means all of us. He walks on water and starts sinking, and that's where we leave him. Always, all preachers. I tell you, he got his eyes off of the off of the word, and he began to sink. And the waves were boisterous, and the wind was blowing, and the circumstances around him shifted immediately. And when your circumstances shift, you must be careful because you'll fall by the wayside and you'll sink in the depth. And we leave him there, and Jesus got to pull him up. But Jesus reached down and took his hand, as he'll do for you, and he'll pick you up and hold you in his arms. Here's where we leave him that's where we leave him outside I don't know how many feet away from the boat sinking in the water and port Jesus God bless him had to come down there and, and rescue him and we never preach him walking back in the boat Jesus did not say hop in my back son obviously you don't know what you're doing let's go and Jesus piggyback him come on y'all he's getting heavy y'all better pray for me now you know because I don't know how much I can hold up on to defy the law of gravity with him on my back he walked back in the boat some people are afraid of and I'm gonna preach this of stepping out in faith and doing anything because they are afraid that they're going to get in the middle of it and sink but what they have to understand when you have that stinking sinking sensation Jesus is standing right beside you, whoa, Lord, to pick you back up and say, I'm the one that told you to get out of your nest, so don't worry about it. If you trip up in the process, I will still be here picking you up and helping you to do what I told you to. Somebody give the Lord a praise before I keep preaching in this place. I, I, I was told by the Lord during the worst recession a few years ago, worst recession since the Great Depression, I was told by the Lord to buy property and build a gathering place for a generation. 72,000 square feet. And the bill of the building was $18 million. And I had $4 million to start building with. And God says, if I can use my metaphor, get out of the nest. And when God tells you to get out of the nest, it's up to God to take care of you when you step out of the comfort zone. And my builder and architect were talking. They started nothing. The architect lays the plans down. The builder says, tell him he's got to get a draw from a bank. And they said, no bank will give him a draw. Well, he's got to have a loan. No bank. My banks, my banks were not giving me any loan. Three banks. One bank finally said, well, if you get into an emergency at the end and need the money, we can give you up to $2 million, but that's all we can give you. It's for kids. Kids don't have income. Kids don't have money. They're not paying tithe. How are you going to build a building and uh, this big? I mean, look, my hall, if I take the seats, I will take the seats out of this hall in this building next month for two services, and we'll put five to 6,000 kids on the floor of that building. That's how big one hall is. Are you tracking with me? Say yes. But when I stepped out, we begin to pray. God 
wake up the spirit of a millionaire. And he did. He woke up the spirit of a millionaire that we don't even know. I, I mean, I know privately, but there's no name on that check because it comes from a fund from up north. And somebody by the Holy Ghost, I didn't get on TV and say, I'm building the building. Y'all got to help me. I never said it one time. I never asked for an offering one time. I never asked people to help me build OCI one time. And the people I had were mostly ex-drug addicts and young people. They didn't have enough money to hardly go to the bank and borrow money to, to buy a pair of shoes. And God, when I stepped out of the nest and was free falling by faith, I felt some eagle get under me. I'm going to talk about it in about two minutes. And pick me up on eagle's wings. And somebody gave us $14 million over two years. That You ain't hearing what I... Y'all you, would be doing cartwheels off the balcony if that was you. One person, one group, one organization, one somebody. And it paid my building off before I got in it. I'm trying to tell somebody here. When you know it's God, can nobody talk you out of it. When you know it's God, there's a faith that will come in you. And let me tell you something. When you know it's God and God has put you on an assignment. Simon, you don't have to look to your grandma, your mama, your aunt, your uncle, or anybody else to say, do you approve of this? Do you think this is going to work? There is a knowing down in your knower that the almighty God has come in on your behalf. Does anybody hear the little preacher this morning trying to help somebody to tell you what it is you've been dealing with? The restlessness in your spirit. Watch. The restlessness in your spirit will cause you to want to change everything around you, thinking if you change a certain thing, the restlessness gets better, right? You get restless. Oh, I hate this car. So you got to have another one. You get another one. Oh, I hate where I live. Let's move. You spend a whole year moving. You're restless. Got to move. Got to move. Don't like it. Then you get, to the, you get to the other house and you don't like it. Hello. Hello. You change stuff. You change styles. You change your clothes. And some people get so restless, they change who they're married to. It's true. Why did you, why did you leave him, her? I just, I just, I was unhappy. I was just restless all the time. And the problem is you're trying to change stuff when the, God wants to change your heart. The restlessness is about God changing you. And while you're spending all your time changing everything around you, trying to get you feeling better, and you change everything and you're still not feeling better, quit looking at your stuff. Because let me talk to you about stuff. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, stuff. Let me talk to you about stuff. Do you understand that the Bible says that everything we see was made of things that do not appear? Do you know what those things that do not appear are? Atoms. Everything has atoms. Everything has the molecules of creation, the atom, the atomic particles, all of that. You're sitting on a chair that has, is, consists of atoms. If the atoms just went crazy, the whole chair of the fabric would fall apart. The whole universe would fall apart. But here's my point. God, who came from nowhere, because mm -hmm, he didn't have anywhere to come from, stood on nothing because it was nothing to stand on, reached out there and spoke to nothing and commanded it become something, called it earth and told it to hang on nothing. And that's what it's been doing ever since. And the Bible says he stretches out the north over the empty place and he hangs the earth upon nothing. And so everything you've got, even the tree was spoken into existence from nothing but the voice of God. All the animals were spoken into existence by the voice of God. God spoke everything into existence but created man in his image, in his likeness. Don't have time to preach the difference between God speaking it and God creating it. But there is a difference. But my point, ladies and gentlemen, is simply this. That after you have everything, you've gained the whole world and you've got all your stuff remember stuff will go back to nothing you go back to dust everything you got that metal will rust until it doesn't exist a thousand years from now that wood will deteriorate hundreds of years from now and that log house will not even be there if it's not treated properly ladies and gentlemen what I'm trying to say to you is this when you seek after stuff and you seek after things it doesn't really make people happy I go preach in California and I've got sitting beside me and behind me I'm not going to name names if I drop names everybody in this 
this building would know who I'm talking about. But you see people who sit behind, beside you that have realities, t television programs. You have people behind you whose family members are top rock and roll singers, number one sellers for 10 years in rock that's totally backslid and they're, they're away from God. And you will discover when you talk to them that they can have the finest car, the best house in Malibu, and money in their bank account. And they're still waking up with drugs in the morning with hangovers and alcohol because they're not happy with what they've got. You hear me? Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Where's my old school Billy Preston people? Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You listen to me, but God plus nothing equals everything. Hallelujah. When you, when you put him in the equation. So let me, let me break this down a little bit deeper for you. I want to talk to you about eagles for just a moment. An eagle builds its nest as high as it can, and it's known as the king of the birds, the king of the air. The nest of an eagle can weigh between one to two tons. That's how big they are. Large enough to have numerous baby eagles living in that nest being cared for. The nest is built over a period of time using twigs, and finally, eventually, layered in feathers so that the little baby eaglets, when they're in the nest, are extremely comfortable and do not feel the pain or the pressure or the prickling of the twigs that the nest is made from. However, it is interesting when a female eagle gets to the age or the place of maturity where she wants to, we don't call it eagles getting married, of course, but they, she wants to find what we would say is her male counterpart the loving eagle that will care for her and care for her babies. It's interesting what she does. They just don't look at each other and in their mind say, hey, let's go. <laughs> Come on, you can spend the rest of my life with you. <laughs> I will tell you that an eagle, an eagle remains faithful to the one person that it connects to as long as it lives. It's a, it's a very faithful uh, creature of creation. Now, if she's interested and gets his attention, she flies real high with a, with a twig in her mouth. And then he is flying, watching her just below her. This happens. And she lets go of the tw twig, and an eagle can nosedive at 200 miles an hour. And he is to catch that twig in midair. If he can catch that twig in midair, she immediately is attracted to him, and she starts testing him on how good he is. Well, I our marriages might be better if we kind of did this kind of stuff, you know, test them on how, how they are before you get them. So she keeps testing him, and so she'll get a bigger twig and a bigger stick and a heavier stick, and she'll fly, and he flies right underneath her, and then she lets go of that stick, and he's got to whoosh, focus in, hone in, grab that stick. After she's tested him, they then get together and start building a nest together because here's the reason she has tested him with big sticks. Ready? She has tested him because... When they have babies and they get a certain age, she is going to push the babies out of the nest. And they ha cannot fly. They have, you, can, you cannot learn how to fly living in your nest. You have to get out of your nest to learn how to fly on your own. When she pushes the baby out, he will be circling the nest and she will watch him and she'll push that baby out and he has to catch it on his back. And that little baby, of course, as you know, is trying to flap and she will do this several times until that baby learns how to get the wind under its wings and one day she'll push it and instead of that baby needing papa, that baby will have learned how to glide, learned how to catch itself, and will fly with daddy. <laughs> Lord, 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 Lord. I don't know why talking about birds makes me want to cry. <laughs> now, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4, God says this to Israel. I bore you up on eagle's wings. I bore you up. And here's what God is saying. When you go to get out of the nest, you're going to flop and you're going to flutter. But don't worry, before you hit bottom, I'm going to catch you. 
Who did I just talk to right there? It looks like, honey, we're about to hit bottom. Wait a minute. He just hadn't showed up yet. He still sees you. He's the one directing your life. Whew. Good preaching, Perry. Amen, Holy Ghost. Thank you. It is your word. It's coming from you. Let me say this to you now. People always talk about, I'm going to go to the next level. I'm going to go. You will never go higher than where your nest is. If your nest is built low because you're just afraid of stepping out, you'll never go higher than where you're at. But if you build high, high expectations, high faith, high possibilities, then that is the level that God will launch you. The level of your expectation. The, mm, the level of your faith. But let me talk to you. Let me talk to the church folks that are here. Ready? I was raised in, in a uh, full gospel denomination, that uh, Pentecostal denomination, the oldest existing one in the entire United States. goes back to the 1800s, early 1900s. And there's one problem I always saw, and this is not trying to be negative in any way, but in my preaching and in my revivals, I quit having, I literally stopped having revivals. My revivals pastor used to go three weeks. We started just like this and we'd go on the next week and we'd go on every night and four weeks and five and a half weeks and seven and a half weeks. And I went to one church three months, every night, three months preaching. And it was glorious and hundreds and hundreds saved and hundreds and hundreds baptized in the Holy Spirit. But you know why I stopped it? Listen, because I discovered that in those older, classical, smaller towns, that they were way too content. They were what I call nesters. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, how can I explain this? They were... They were very traditional, meaning they were stuck in their way. They only wanted certain kinds of singing, meaning they were stuck in their nest. Any kind of preaching that was different than they were used to, any doctrine that they'd never studied, they didn't want to hear it. They were settled in their nest. And you can always preach, Perry. You can always tell a nester versus an eagle because the eagle always spreads its wings and the nesters always fold their arms. See, the, the eaglets or the mature eagles in the congregation who know who God is and know I've been through it and he brought me through. Always keep their wings. See, you keep your wings spread because you never know when the wind's going to blow by. And when that wind blows, you want to get on that thing and start riding in the presence of God as long as you can. But I got tired of not looking. I'll use my metaphor here. Not looking at eagles spreading their wings in an 11-week revival, but the nesters doing this the whole time. Well, I don't know about all this. I don't know if that Perry Stone is of God or not. <laughs> They've actually said that. Well, why don't you think he's of God? Because I'm telling you. Now, this happened to me. This happened to me in a revival. I don't think he's of God because of three things. Number one, we're using way too much toilet paper in the church, and it's costing us money with all these people coming. <laughs> this happened to me. Number two. People are starting to park in the grass. It's killing the grass. You wouldn't believe how many old spots we got out there on the grass right now killing this grass. It took us years to grow. Third thing is we're having septic problems with all the toilet paper and the people coming. Had to call Rotor Rooter last week twice to come out here. Now, preacher, I'm telling you, we need to. Sh this happened to me. We need to shut this meeting down. I don't see you flapping your arms. 
I see you with your arms folded, Mr. Board member, standing there complaining. And your problem is you got a nest and you've been in that nest of that church for 30 or 40 years. You think you own the tree and the rock that it's on. You think it's you and your family that has built the thing. Without them, the kingdom of God would not exist. And you are settled in your nest. I'm going to say it publicly. This is the reason why they are all over America. They are all over places like West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Rural churches that are now dying, that are selling their building, that have to sell their building because all of their members died as nesters. Nobody got one to the Lord. No worship ever went on. No breakthrough in an altar service. They just preach and Send everybody home for years. And the precious older saints, many who were godly people, died and went to be with the Lord. And there was nobody left, no young chicklets, no young eagles to carry that church on. And I'm telling you, in Bradley County, Tennessee, with 380 churches, I took a drive one day and found four churches for sale. Four buildings that used to have 50, 100, 150 people for sale. And the reason is the people of God would never get out of their nest. The people of God would never worship. They folded their arms. They folded their wings. They would not clap. They folded their wings. They would not lift their hands. And the problem was they had a group of people that said, don't ruffle our feathers in our nest. Don't stir the feathers up because when mama took the feathers out of the nest, the eagles could not be comfortable. So when she starts plucking them one by one and the eagle says, I want back in the nest. I want want security. I want to know how it happens. I want to control everything. I, I, I feel uncomfortable if I'm not in control. And the feathers are. So what you do is, you ever heard anybody say this? Don't rustle their feathers. Do you know where that comes from? It's the eagle. That's where that metaphor comes from. Don't, don't, don't ruffle, don't, don't ruffle their feathers. And what will happen to you is this. You, per, and I'm speaking you, I'm talking to the body. I'm not necessarily talking to this Beaumont church, but I'm talking to the body in general. We, we, oh, I'm going to say it. Now listen, this, this, is, this is powerful. This is from the Lord. We get to the point where we don't want to be challenged. We want to be comfortable. We don't want our feathers ruffled because we want to be secure. How, how, how can we sit around in communities on Sundays and make a bunch of eagles happy? There's a whole movement in the body of Christ. And you know what it is. It's called the seeker-sensitive movement. And their goal is to pad the nest with feathers. Have those Christians on Sunday sit there happy and comfortable And feed them a worm every now and then that they can say, oh, that was sweet. How can I make you comfortable when kids are dying of overdoses every weekend? When kids are turning to prostitution, when little girls are aborting their babies. And you want me or you want a pastor to stand in a pulpit and keep you in your little nest so you can be comfortable. And your little fanny feels really nice on the the feathers. No way. Excuse me. No way. Because God says I will not let you die in your nest I will push you out of your comfort comfort zone because I've got to have people who are catching the little ones that are falling they're falling They don't know God. They don't know how to turn to him. They don't know. The father will catch me. It's going to be okay. I have faith in God. They don't know that. And the only thing they know is they're looking for one person, one mama, one dad, one grandpa, one grandmother, one aunt, one uncle, just one, that when they say, I'm failing, my body is failing, my mind is failing, my emotions are failing, somebody will grab them by the arm and say, You won't fall on my watch. (laughs) Tell you just a brief story. When my son, when my son was horribly, 
horribly addicted. It was every day. And me and, me and his mom are praying, God, do not let my boy die. Please don't let him die. Don't let him die a, a, this way. Don't, you didn't give him to me for him to go out like this, laying on the side of a road or addicted to drug and dying in a car wreck from drinking too much. He had a brand new car and in two years had six dents on it where he'd wrecked it, drinking. Backing into posts, didn't know what he was doing. Going over top of curbs, busting his tire. <sighs> but I do remember this, and I want you to hear me for a moment. I do remember times of watching him fall. And I said to my boy, huh, there's nothing, nothing you will ever do that disappoints me about you. And he said, he said, well, you know, I'm an embarrassment to you in your ministry. I said, I don't care what you think you are. And I would look at him and say, you listen to me. There's two, there's two things in you. There's a fool in you and there's a king in you. And I refuse to speak to the fool in you. When I talk to you, I'm going to talk to you like I'm talking to the king that is on the inside of you. I call you a man of God. I'm not a man of God. Oh, you're not now, but you will be. I call you saved. I don't even know if God exists. Well, he does exist, and you're going to be saved. So you might as well get, well, I'm never going to preach, and I'm never going to enter the ministry, and I swear I'll never work for you. Oh, I'm not talking to the fool in you, son. I'm talking to the king in you. I'm talking to the king in you. Ladies and gentlemen, in your children and in your grandchildren, there's a fool in them, but there's a king and a queen in them. Don't worry. You stand there. Let God pick them up when they're falling. Grab them before they hit bottom and let them know. Let them know God's... Let them, let them know God's going to be... Uh, <laughs> mama, mama picks them up, throws them out of the nest. Daddy gets them on the wings, brings them back to the nest. Mama picks them up, throws them out of the nest. I, I get tickled when I talk about mama throwing you out of the nest. You know, we got kids 30, 35 still living at home. <laughs> I want to talk to you mamas because I have, look, my, my, my wife, my wife, Oh, Lord, I have, to, I have to get on her sometimes because she's still wanting to make Jonathan's bed when he's 25. <laughs> well, if I don't do it, it'll never get done. Oh, it'll get done. I'll whip his tail. It'll get done. Just turn it. We'll see. He'll make the bed. Picking up his clothes after him. St I'm talking the boy looks like a hurricane hit after a week. Well, that's my job as a mama. No, it's not a, your job for have a 25-year-old sitting up in a basement or up in an attic playing video games and you're bringing him his Coca-Cola and you're bringing him his water and you're cooking his meal and taking it to him so he can watch TV. Get that lazy thing out of that nest. Get some feathers, stir him up. I'm, I'm preaching better than you're listening. <laughs> all right we're almost done listen God has to disturb your spirit to get you out of your comfort zone and a lot of times he, he may not use a he may not use a major situation to shake you up but I will tell you what you will feel you will feel very restless when God's about to transfer you into something different or something new, something you've never done, where it's going to take faith, you will get a restlessness and you won't be able to sleep well at night. You'll wake up in the middle of the night and you'll say to yourself, I do not know what's going on. Who am I talking to now? Man, I, I, I don't know what in the world. What's the deal? Well, baby, I can't, I can't sleep. It's been weeks. I can't sleep. I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just like, I don't have peace. That's like, I, I, I'm not confused or nothing like that. I just don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? A am, I, am I going in the right direction? Is this God? Is this just me? But I'll tell you what you'll feel. When you get there and you start, this is for someone here, 
and you start seeking God, you really seek him. Oh God, show me your will. Show me your purpose. Show me what I am to do. God will show you. And right before you think this is not going to work, you will feel an eagle. I'm using a metaphor. You'll feel the, you'll feel the father's arms take you. Has anybody ever been there? Hey, let's see. Let's see. Has anybody ever been there? <clears throat> One of the most difficult things I ever had to do in my life, I'm going to share with you something in closing and try to tie all this together. I'm just about done. And I'm going to give you an illustration of what the Lord wants me to tell you about this, the summary. But one of the hardest things for me to do when I was 18 years of age was I had to get in a car by myself for years. And this is before GPS, this is before cell phones. I had to have a map with a letter of a pastor with directions and go to towns I've never been in and try to find a church and try to find, and I, I remember I kept quarters for pay phones. Because that, in the day, now y'all, you kids don't even remember this. I, you, I feel like a dinosaur talking to some of you now. I had, a, I had a phonograph player in, you know what that is, record player in my office. And this kid walks in and said, Mommy, what's that? I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm a dinosaur. What is going on here? Let's go stick it in an antique shop and sell it. I had autism, and I still have a little bit. It's not near, near what. It's lower spectrum, but if it kicks in, it kicks in. Now, listen to me, and let me tell you something for a minute. I had to get in a car drive across the United States by myself with no cell phones, only using maps and letters from pastors. I would book my meetings so close that I finished a four-week revival and drove at night from Tuscaloosa, Alabama to Virginia Beach, Virginia. It was about a 14-hour drive. If I remember, about 14, let's see, yeah, about 14-hour drive. And start preaching a revival the next day. I was so exhausted, I couldn't hardly even feel the nerves in my body. My dad went from salt and pepper hair to just about solid gray hair in three years. And he said to me before he died, he said, do you see my gray hairs? He said, you can ask your mama. <laughs> I, can't tell you the, the, I can't tell you the hours that I would get up at 12 midnight knowing you were so crazy that you wanted to drive at night. And when you have this kind of autism, you function at night better than you do at the day, honestly. And I could, I could drive all night. And he said, I'm, I'm a, and one time I pulled over on the road on a mountain. I was so sleepy in Charlottesville, North Carolina. I fell asleep for four hours. And he called the state police because I should have been home by a certain time. And I was five hours late getting there. And he said, I looked in the mirror and watched my hair turn gray. And he was serious. He said, because I, I, I was so worried about something happening to you. In my first revival, it went three weeks in Montcalm, West Virginia. We had a night where they honored my dad and I in West Virginia. And Polly Blair got up. I was 18. And she said to the people, when Perry Stone Jr., preached his first revival that went long at my church as a kid. He stayed in my house. I remember it. I remember her and her husband very well. And she said, he did not eat for three weeks. And I said, Polly, are you sure about that? I said, are you sure? I know I fasted a lot. She said, Perry, you didn't eat. She said, you were skin and bones. You look like a skeleton. And my husband and I were worried that you were just going to pass out in the pulpit. Now, I fasted a lot because I had a hunger for God's presence. And I was willing to pay the price to get what I needed. That's why the revival started breaking out. But I also was so shy, I did not want to sit at a dinner table and talk to people that I didn't know well. I would rather lock myself in a room and not eat all day as to have to sit down and talk to people. Never knew what the problem was. I thought it was a personality thing. It's the autism that I have. It's an awkward social. You never know it from the pulpit. Because how many of you know the anointing covers everything? You just get anointed. People say, wow, he must be Mr. Friendly. Here's my word to you. Hi, how you doing? Where you're from? God bless you. That's what I'll tell you. People say, he don't talk much outside the pulpit. If I don't have anything to say, I don't talk much. Now get my wife into Alabama and we go to an Alabama football game. You know. She can't keep her mouth shut. 
But you see where I'm coming from? You see where I'm coming from? I had to do things where God threw me out of a nest. And I'm telling you, I was uncomfortable. And I did not enjoy it. And I fought depression for three years. Three years of my life every day. Someone said, how did you break it? By the Lord? No, by a woman. (laughs) You want to hear that story? I married this really super cute, I'm talking adorable, talks like a southern belle, hot chick by the name of Pam, who I've been married to for 38 years. And I don't know what there is about a hot woman. It'll break you out of depression in a heartbeat. That's all I'm going to tell you. I just want you to know, marry a hot one and it'll break you out. I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not playing. I don't know any other way of describing her. My, my, kids, my kids on staff, the guys that I mentor and we hang out with, they say, you keep talking about Miss Pam. And man, she was like crazy and you couldn't live without her. And when you saw her, you didn't want nobody else to have her. You got a picture of her? <laughs> so I went through my pictures and I found one, and I mean, she had the long hair, and it was, cr- it was crinkled, and she had this red dress on, and she just looked. And I said, okay, boys, come here. Come here, I want to show y'all. And I had a couple who were in the dance room. I said, come here, you, you, and you. Come here, Daniel, y'all come here. Stand right here. I said, now, I'm going to show you what I married. Now, she's still cute, but this is what I saw when I first met Pam. And I held up, and they said, oh, my God. <laughs> they said, Pops, Pops, you weren't blind. I said, no, but there was times I had to pray with one eye covered and look with the other. Watch and pray. Oh, God, watch and pray. Watch and pray. All right. (laughs) Y'all just got it, didn't you? (laughs) Just kind of ran over your head and came back, you know. Okay, now. Now, I want to show you this about the nest, and I'm going to show you one more thing, and we're going to tie it together. I now realize something. I always thought, okay, I am a little weird. I'm, I'm, I'm social awkward. I, I like to stay in rooms. I can stay at a hotel room all day and study, never talk to anybody. And, 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 and Tammy and Robbie work with me, and they will tell you, I go to an office. I don't even go to lunch. I've been with lunch with you two times in nine years. Two to- That's my staff, Two times. I don't even go to lunch, and I am in an office away from me. In fact, it's, it's hilarious. My office, Tammy's my assistant, but Tammy's office is in another building, and I'm in this building. <laughs> Tell me what guy that runs a worldwide ministry secretary is in a whole other building. <laughs> I do that so nobody will bother me. You know, she teased you the other day, Pastor, about her phone being dead. She says, he sends me 100 texts. Now you know why she gets 100 texts, because I'm not there. Tammy, where are you? Tammy, do this. Tammy, do that. We're two different buildings. But I want to talk to you about something. And I'm not saying this in any boasting way. It's for the glory of God, but I'll make a point and you'll understand it. The Lord had me take 10 years to do a whole commentary on the Bible. It took me 10 years. No, I'm sorry. It took me seven years to write. It's taken 10 years to get all together. The New Testament's out, but the Old Testament's that thick. It's a 500,000 word commentary. Now you listen to what I'm about to say. When God pushed me out of a nest, one of the things I had to do and learn was by myself to spend hours, and I'm talking 170,000 hours of study that is mostly done by myself in a room by myself. And the only time I'll go, I'll go home in the evenings, and I love going home because if Pam's cooking, we all, all the kids go crazy, but that's my life. But see, God had to get me out of my zone to go out and learn to fly on my own, knowing that the Father was right there with me to get me to do, to get me to do everything I've done in 40 years. Any other personality type, doctors have told me, any personality type that exists could not have done what you've done and written 70 books, a commentary on the whole Bible, a monthly magazine, plus 150 messages a year unless you have autism. They said it humanly is impossible. But what you have makes you so focused 
that you can blot out everything around you and focus on one thing and get downloads. Both sides of your brain operate when everybody else operates on one side. So what I thought was a curse, why am I that way? I realized he had to throw me out of the nest at 18 and say, I'm going to teach you some things, me and you. Hallelujah, am I talking to anybody that understands what I'm preaching? But I'm going to help you do everything you do. Because right when you think you can't do it, I'm going to pick you up. Right when you think it can't be done, just, just, just look for me, I'll be there. I hope I'm building somebody's faith in this house this morning. Finally, finally, God will stir you up to get you to the place and to the people you need to be that you are not aware of you need to be around or places you need to be. Now, I'm going to do this in two minutes. I was going to marry a young girl from Virginia, and the nest got stirred. I did not feel comfortable. After dating her two years, something didn't feel right. And when, because I had that restlessness, I broke up. And in three weeks later, no, it was actually two weeks, I met Pam in Alabama in a revival that I had been married to for 30 some years. And if I had married the other girl, I'm not saying we couldn't have made it work, but it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> I don't mean this disrespectfully to her. She's been divorced several times and there's just all kinds of issues. And God showed me there was issues and if I, if I didn't just change and stop, how many of you know? He stirs the nest. You checking? Throws you away from that situation, but then comes along, picks you up. You tracking with me? Then I, I was, right before Pam and I were married, I was going to move to Virginia because it was my home state. And there was trouble that broke out in this church and in the area. And I got a check in my spirit. I already had a board, a ministry name, everything picked out. I got a check in my spirit. This is not where you're supposed to be. So watch this. The restlessness and the stirring up feeling was God's signal to me that I was going in the wrong direction. You got to discern the restlessness. Because the restlessness is a sign of transition of some kind. We did not go to Virginia. We moved to Cleveland, Tennessee. Make a long story short, God kept me away from the place I should not be. Good people up there, but I would have never built OCI. There would have never been a youth ministry. Nothing that we're doing, nothing would have ever happened. And I'd have ended up pastoring a church somewhere. And nothing wrong with pastoring, but that wasn't God's will. Number three, hey, I was getting ready to buy property 16, eight, did I say something? Y'all are laughing. What did I say? Did I? I, I, I missed it. Am I okay? Tammy and Robbie, are, did I say something? Did y'all catch something? When she yelled out laughing, are we okay? Okay. I'll go back and listen to it later. They'll tell me at lunch, trust me. I, they're, they're like family, so they will torment you at times. All right, here we go. God, I was going to buy property in Cleveland, Tennessee when the Lord spoke to me to father a generation and there was a pastor who's a very close friend of mine that had 16 acres along the interstate and there were like eight hotels that were right there and I thought, oh, this is cool. We can build a building. The hotels are there. People can walk to the meeting and we started, we got right up to the day, up to the day of we're going to sign the papers to buy the property and the Lord speaks to me and says, this is not big enough and I said, what do you mean? He said, because I want you to be involved with youth. And one day there'll be a camp type setting. And I said, Lord, why didn't you tell me that before all of this? He said, I was trying to, and you were too busy to listen. I got rebuked by the spirit of God. And it was true. I was just so busy. I wasn't listening. When I stopped to listen, he tells me. So we, we, Looked for property, and I'm going to make a long story short. A gentleman owned property behind my ministry center. It was over 100 acres. And the Lord spoke to me that we needed 100 acres. And I, did, I went to him to see if he'd sell it, and he didn't want to. He said, I'll pray about it. He says, God, am I supposed to sell the property to Perry? And he did scripture roulette. You know what that is? You open your Bible and look at the verse. Okay. One, two, three. There it is. There it is. 
Judas hung himself. Oh, God, that's not the verse. Give me the verse. Jesus. 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 Here we go. And we're going to do it again. Whoop. Shut up behind. We're going to do it again. Glory to God. Go thou and do likewise. Oh, God, this is not the way you, you know, this is not the way you do it. Okay. He opened the Bible to this verse. He was, he's, his wife is Pentecostal. He's Baptist. And he opened the Bible that said, no man has left fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, and forsaken houses and lands that will not in this life receive a hundredfold eternal life and life to come. And he said, oh, my Lord, forsaking the land. So he came to me and he said, I got to sell you this land. I do not want to, but I have to sell you the property. So what we built on in Cleveland is 110 acres we have. But don't miss this. When the man was obedient, there was a recession in, and he is an earth mover. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's in construction where he has the big machines. There is no business during a recession like we had. And when he sold me the property, he got the University of Tennessee's deal, the Volkswagen plant deal, the Lee University deal, and he got so many, 16 contracts. Now, I'm not talking about years later. He had so many contracts. Listen to this, how crazy it is. He overbid when he got busy. He just said, I'm going to overbid. And they still gave it to him. <laughs> they, he'd overbid by thousands of dollars and be, be way over everybody else. Ah, oh, go ahead, Steve, you can have it. And I think, didn't he not tell us a total of 16 different, some little, some big, came to him? Here's the point that I want to make. So... God is stirring you up to pray. He is stirring you up to seek him. He is stirring up your nest because he doesn't want you to stay comfortable where you're at. He wants you to stay in the stirring ups of God. But the final thing I'll say to you is this. If you're questioning why it feels like you're stuck, it's because the Papa Eagle circles the nest on the mountain, the same way a plane does when it's in a holding pattern. <laughs> so when you feel stuck, it's not that you're stuck. It's that God has you in his holding pattern. And you'll hear him say soon, fasten your seatbelt. We're approaching your destination. Hallelujah.